I have two questions for you today. The first one is this. If you died today, do you know for certain that you would go to heaven? Question number two. So let's say you did die today and you are standing before God and he says, why should I let you into heaven? What would you say to him? If you are like me, at one point in my life, I would start listing how good I was or how many times I've gone to church or how many people I've helped. But it turns out that the Bible has a very different answer of how a person can know for certain that they're going to go to heaven. So it's, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use an illustration, but the authority of this is what the Bible actually says. So here we are. In the beginning, there was God. God is love. God has been love and in three persons for all eternity. Well, it's the nature of love to share itself. So that's why God created us. God loved and so he created man or mankind to be able to receive his love and to give love Back. All of creation glorifies God. The trees, the, the animals, the stars, but everything else is pre-programmed. Only mankind was made with a free will where we could receive love and possibly give love back to God. But for that to be so, there had to be a choice. And if you know any of the story, you know man chose sin. Sin, Isaiah 59, 1 and 2 says this. It's a point that that God says, my hand is not short that I couldn't save you and my ear is not deaf that I couldn't hear you, but your sins have separated you from your God. This is the nature of sin. Here is God. Here is man. And this chasm here is what sin has created. Now there are three things every human being needs to know about their sin. Number one, all have sinned. This is Romans 3.23. It says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But it's a funny thing about sin. Everybody hasn't sinned in the same way. Notice this. The center of sin is I. It's me running my own life, me doing my own thing, me going my own way with some, it's murder, rape, robbery with others, you go to church with a three-piece suit, but I is in charge. I is running the show. The second thing is that all deserve death. This is Romans 6.23, and it says that the wages of sin is death. We're, we're very familiar with wages. Wages is what we earn. Wages is what we would get if we got what was coming to us. And the Bible says for our sin that we deserve death, that this is what we have earned. And for in the Bible, death is much more serious than physical death. Death is separation from God. And if you and I die in our sin, we will be eternally away from God. So here's the third one, judgment. The Bible says, and this is Romans 6.23, or nine, I'm sorry, 9.27, Hebrews 9.27, it's appointed unto man once to die, and after that, the judgment. There is no reincarnation, there's no second chance. We all go through this life one time, and the most important day of our life is after we've left this body and we stand before God in judgment. Well, this is man in his sin, and we, we recognize this. We recognize this distance, this chasm between us and God, so we try to get back to God. And people try to get back to God in a number of ways. One way is good works. The idea here is if I do enough good, it will outweigh my bad. Another one is religion. And Religion, the problem with this one, of course, is there's so many different religion, and they all say something different, but it's the idea that man has a religion that if I do everything that the, the priest or the pastor or the imam or the 
the monk tells me to do, then I will be good enough. And, and the promise of religion is that follow us, give enough money, climb and kiss the right statue, and we will, we will guarantee you that you'll be okay. The third one is morality. We, we've got a new word for morality today, sincerity. Simply the idea that if I do whatever I think is right and try to follow my own heart, that that will be good enough. A couple of things that I want you to notice about this. First, um, that all of these things are far short of God. Here's what you need to understand about God. God is holy beyond our knowing. We all fall far, far short of God's standard, which would be perfection. It actually says in the Bible that our righteous deeds are as filthy rags to him. We can't conceive of how holy God is. The second thing I want you to notice about this is that some people are better than others. And we spend a lot of time looking at each other and we get a false sense of righteousness. That, that I'm, I'm no worse than that person. I'm certainly better than that person. Therefore, I must be okay. And that is absolutely not the case. God's not comparing you to somebody else. God is only comparing you and I to his own holiness. This is why it says in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, it is by grace you are saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, lest any man boast. So there is a way to be saved, but that way is not by man's good works, man's religion, or man's morality. The answer to man's sin problem is not on man's side. It's on God's side. So this is John 5, 24. Jesus says this, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not come into judgment. Now this is quite a message. Whoever hears and believes this message, instead of getting death, they get eternal life. And instead of getting a judgment for their sins, there is no judgment for their sins. And so my question for you is this, what was the message? What is this message? What did God do to bridge this chasm that sin had made? I'm going, to, I'm going to give you the answer right now, and chances are you've heard the answer, maybe even a thousand times. But I want you to maybe hear it a little differently than you have in the past. So it turns out that even though sin separated us from God's presence, sin never separated us from God's love. Right from the beginning, God made a plan in his great love for us, where he would become a man. He had to become a man because man had sinned. But he also had to be God because God's standard is perfect. So Jesus Christ came into the world not to be a good example, even though he was the greatest example, not to teach, even though he was the greatest teacher. Jesus Christ came into the world for one reason, and that's to die. The Bible says in 1 Peter, 318, that Christ died for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, in order to bring us to God. It says in Isaiah 53, 6, we like sheep have all gone astray, each to our own way, but the Lord laid the iniquity of us all upon him. Now chances are, as I put this in, you said to yourself, oh yeah, yeah, that's what we believe. Yeah, I believe that. Yep. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Jesus died for our sins. Okay. So now we, we get to the, the final part of our, our, our uh, diagram here. And it's about this word believes. Once you agree that it's really important that the way God defines believes and the way you define believes are the same. Here's, here's how God doesn't just define belief. Mental assent to the facts. In fact, it says in James that even the demons give mental assent to this. Even they believe and, and shudder. So when the Bible says believe, saving faith, believing faith, it means three things. Number one, 
And this is John 1, 12. It says, he came to his own, his own received him not. But to as many as received him, to them he gave the power to become the children of God. So to biblically believe, I must receive Christ. Christianity, at the end of the day, is not following a set of rules and it's not believing a set of doctrines. Biblical Christianity, I must receive a person. Secondly, this is Revelation 3.20, Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. To biblically believe, I must open my heart. Now, it turns out that sin has so broken the image of God in us that we can't choose God on our own. God actually has to come looking for us. He actually has to knock first. But it's really important that you don't mistake God's knocking for you opening. You can have an experience with God and still not open your door. It is God doesn't take away this free will, this love that's freely given is very important to God. So he will not, and he can knock really loud. He knocks through beauty. He can knock through pain. He can knock through an addiction you can't conquer on your, your own. He can knock in a number of different ways. But he leaves it to us to open our hearts. He will knock. He will invite. And then thirdly, and this is the last one, Romans 10, 9. It says, if you confess Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. To be saved, I must confess Jesus as Lord. This is, this is the most difficult one for Americans. <laughs> Americans want to be forgiven. And they want to go to heaven when they die. Here's what they don't want. They don't want somebody telling them what to do. But to, to be saved, to biblically believe, I must repent. I must give over the center of my life, the lordship of my life to Jesus. To confess Jesus as Lord simply means this. It means, Jesus, you have the right to change me. You have the right to change any area of my life. My entire life is yours to change and I am willing to have you change it. So, this brings us to the end. There are three people in the world. Here's, here's number one. This guy says, bah. I don't want God. I don't want to talk about God. Please leave me alone. The second guy's over here, and this guy is saying glory. He is just a regular person like you and I, but the reason why he knows he's going to go to heaven when he dies is because he's taken his trust out of his good works, out of his religion, out of his morality, and he's put his trust in Jesus Christ and the finished work on the cross. He knows salvation is not about how good I am. It's about how good Jesus was. It's about how good this sacrifice was. So there is an assurance that that. I am walking with Jesus. This, this person has opened up. They've heard God knock. They've opened their heart. They've asked Jesus to come in. And they're in a process of Jesus changing them um, called Lordship. Then here's the third person. They're right at the door. They want to be here, but they know they're here. So here's my question. If you had to circle one of these three people, which one is you? If you circle this one, let me tell you how to get over. Because in our mind, we think, if I really worked at this, if I really pursued this, in five years, maybe I could get here, and then maybe in 10 years, I could get here. That's not how it works. Let me tell you how you go from here to here. It's, it's the end of Romans 6.23. It says, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let me, let me help you with gift. It's Christmas. Your mom and dad have purchased something. They've, they've saved up all year long to get you this gift because they, they know you need it and they know you want it. And they come and bring this gift on Christmas. And they're just beaming. They can't wait for you to open your gift. And you pull out your wallet or your purse and say, what am I going to owe you for this? 
and they're, they're going to go, oh my, you, you know, you've completely misunderstood. This isn't your allowance. This isn't about performance. This is about our love for you. We have bought something for you. We've paid a price. You're going to get it for free. And frankly, you could never afford the gift. There's not enough in your account to pay for this gift. This is what salvation is. To receive a gift, you just say thank you and you open it and you use it and that's, that's the repayment you give for a gift. You just accept it and say thank you. So God has purchased a gift for you called eternal life. It was not cheap. It, it, he paid for it with his own blood. That He could not have given you this gift without this. And in this gift called eternal life is everything. Forgiveness is in it, heaven is in it, and a relationship right now with the living God through Jesus Christ is yours right now. And so God is offering this gift and you have to decide whether you want to receive it or not. If you do, all it takes is to sincerely open your heart and pray a prayer. I want, I want to caution you. This is not about, there's no magic in the prayer that I'm going to pray. The power of this is his promise. The power of this is his resurrection. Jesus is alive. But if this is you and you want to go from here to here and you want to receive the gift that God paid for on the cross, I want you to just pray this after me right now. Maybe just put your hand on your heart and pray this after me. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me. I know that I'm a sinner. I know that I fall short of you on my own. But I believe that you died for me on the cross. I believe you paid the wages of sin for me on the cross and that you are knocking on my heart. And so, Lord, right now, I open my heart by faith. I ask you to come in. I ask you to be my Savior and be my Lord. I receive right now by faith your gift of eternal life. Thank you for hearing my prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you won't mind just leaving your hand on your heart, I want to pray for you. Lord, only you can give the witness of the Holy Spirit. Would you come right now to the one that prayed this prayer in sincerity? And would you give a witness that this wasn't just um, a man's opinion or a man's look at things, but God, that you are alive, that you've heard this prayer, and that it is your, it is your delight to forgive them, save them, and give them the assurance of heaven. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Have a great day.